We now turn our attention to limitations to growth. Here are the learning objectives. And here's the outline for the video. Many microorganisms live in biofilms in the environment. It is probably more common than planktonic growth, which is living in liquids. Biofilms are assemblages of bacterial cells that attach to a surface and they're enclosed in an adhesive matrix secreted by the cell. They protect the microorganism from harmful effects and help keep communities organized. They may even have been a stepping stone toward the evolution of multicellular life. Could be. Microbes in the environment will often form biofilms. If you ever stepped on a rock in a stream or noticed that the concrete under a puddle is slipperier, you have experienced a biofilm. Biofilms are also important to disease. Tooth and gum disease is accelerated by the biofilm that forms in your mouth that dentists refer to as plaque. Do what your mom says, floss your teeth. Biofilm formation occurs in three steps. First, cells attach to a surface. As their numbers increase, their quorum sensing mechanisms detect the population increase and cells turn on genes that synthesize a polysaccharide matrix. A sticky mass of cells proliferates and the biofilm expands, forming water channels. The figure on the side shows a biofilm from a top-down view and a side view. A cross-section of a biofilm is shown in the fluorescent microscope. You can see the individual cells embedded in the matrix. This section talks about the limits of bacterial growth. So let's have a brainstorming activity and list as many things that you can think of that would limit bacterial growth. Here's the list that I came up with. Unfavorable environmental conditions and damaging conditions will limit growth. Things like unacceptable temperatures, pH in the wrong range, changes in oxygen levels, changes in solids in the environment, DNA damage, cell envelope damage, or desiccation. You may also run out of nutrients as a microorganism or predators and parasites may attack you. One thing that's important here is that in all of these conditions, cells need to respond to stress and act appropriately. Some of these responses overlap. The ones that are starred in this slide are the ones we will talk about throughout the rest of this lecture. One of the most important physical parameters that contain bacterial growth is temperature. For microbes, the internal temperature is equal to the outside temperature. Each species will have a defined growth range of 30 to 40 degrees centigrade. Their temperature range classifies the microbes. Psychrophiles will grow from 0 to 20 degrees centigrade, mesophiles from about 12 to 45 degrees centigrade, thermophiles from about 40 to 80 degrees centigrade, and extreme thermophiles grow from about 60 to 115 degrees centigrade. Growing at or above the boiling point of water in the deep ocean is a pretty amazing feat, and scientists are very interested in how this works. The question they're really trying to answer is what limits a microbe's ability to grow at low and high temperatures? What do you think happens at the low end of the temperature range? A microbe cannot grow below its low temperature limit because things slow down too much or completely freeze. The rate of enzymatic reactions becomes so slow that an organism is no longer able to carry out the reactions necessary for life. If the temperature gets too low, cell membranes will basically freeze solid. Think butter versus oil. Are these limitations reversible? The answer is in a lot of cases, yes. Microbes can survive freezing for a while and will start back up when it gets warmer. Changes at high temperature are a different story. At these temperatures, proteins unravel, they denature, and often precipitate out of solution. Membranes also become too fluid and tear apart, causing cellular contents to leak into the environment. Are these likely to be reversible? Think about what happens to an egg when you heat it. When you cool it down, it doesn't go back to being a raw egg. So microbes tend to be killed at high temperatures. High temperatures are a very effective way of controlling microbial growth, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Thermophiles 
have habitats including hot springs, artificial thermal sources, hydrothermal vents, compost piles, etc. Adaptations include making heat stable proteins and using saturated fatty acids in lipids and ether linked lipids. There are high temperature thermophiles in the bacteria in archaea. Eukaryotes are more limited because they cannot change all their parts easily to live in high temperature environments. Psychrophiles. Habitats include Arctic and Antarctic regions, glaciers, high altitudes, oceans, caves, refrigerators, and the atmosphere. Adaptations include sta cold stable enzymes that will work at low temperatures, unsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids in their lipids. You will find bacteria, archaea, and eukarya at low temperatures. A second important parameter for growth is pH. Microorganisms must have an internal pH of between 6 and 8 for the proper functioning of cellular metabolism. If the environmental pH gets outside this range, then the bacterium has to compensate by either pumping protons in or out of the cell to keep its internal pH in an acceptable range. Those that can survive acidic conditions, pH is less than 5, are acidophiles. Those that grow best at pH 6 to 8 are neutrophiles, and those that grow best above pH 9 are alkalophiles. Acidophiles. Acidophiles habitats include acid mine drainage, acid hot springs, volcanic soils, acidic soils, and geothermal vents. Also, the parts of the mammalian GI tract, especially near the stomachs of mammals, tend to be quite acidic. Bacteria and archaea and also some fungi and protozoa are found in these environments. The habitats of alkalophiles include soda lakes and alkaline soils. Also, the GI tract of insects. You find bacteria and archaea at high pHs. A third environmental parameter that can affect the growth of microorganisms is water availability. The most important is free water. The amount of water that is not bound to solids. There are two ways that free water can decrease in a solution. The amount of water can decrease in just plain old evaporation, and organisms that can survive under these conditions are called xerophiles. A second way free water can decrease is by increasing the solute concentration. Solutes bind up water and make it unavailable for biological reactions. Microorganisms can grow at higher salt concentrations, and they're called Halophiles. Non-halophiles such as E. coli will very quickly stop growing as salt concentration increases. A halotolerant bacterium such as S. aureus can grow at low, lower salt concentrations but still can grow at higher salt concentrations. A halophile such as Vibrio fischeri requires at least some salt to grow well and an extreme halophile such as Halobacterium selenarum grows even up to saturated salt concentrations. How do cells survive such high solute concentrations? In a typical hypotonic solution, there are more solutes on the inside and water will naturally flow into the cell. This is why most bacteria have a cell wall. However, in a hypertonic solution, more solutes are on the outside of the cell and water will want to flow out of the cell. Non-halophiles will not be able to compensate for this and their cytoplasm will dehydrate, making it impossible for them to grow. Cells that can survive high salt concentrations will accumulate compatible solutes, so named because they are compatible with cellular metabolism. Compatible solutes balance the osmotic stress and prevent the outflow of water. In a typical hypotonic solution, more solutes on the inside fourth environmental parameter is the presence of oxygen. Since you are dependent upon oxygen for your survival, you may not realize that it is a highly reactive gas and can be toxic to cellular metabolism. Some microorganisms cannot survive in the presence of oxygen, and we call them anaerobes. Others are dependent upon oxygen for their survival. These are aerobes. Facultative anaerobes, or facultative aerobes, can survive in the presence or absence of oxygen. 
it is possible to distinguish a subset of facultative anaerobes that don't use oxygen in their metabolism. They are aerotolerant anaerobes. Finally, some microorganisms require a concentration of oxygen that is below atmospheric levels. These are microaerophiles. You can distinguish all these types by growing the bacterium in thioglycolate auger and looking at the growth patterns. Aerobes will only grow at the top where oxygen is available. Anaerobes will only grow at the bottom. And facultative organisms will grow throughout. What makes oxygen so toxic? During cellular metabolism, oxygen will sometimes be reduced by electron carriers, forming superoxide. Superoxide will react with proteins and DNA, damaging them. The enzyme superoxide dismutase can convert superoxide into hydrogen peroxide. However, this itself is a reactive compound that in the presence of iron forms hydroxide radicals and damage the cells. Therefore, Cells have a second detoxifying enzyme. Many times, this is catalase that converts peroxide into water and oxygen. Some other cells use peroxidase. Due to the presence of oxygen in our atmosphere, you may wonder how common are anaerobic environments. They actually turn out to be very common. Below about 100 meters, the ocean has very little oxygen. This is true of a lot of aquatic lakes below, as if they are deep enough. The intestines of many animals also do not contain oxygen. To grow these microbes in the laboratory, specialized equipment is needed, such as the glove box shown at left. I will tell you that this image shows an experiment that went horribly wrong. I just barely made it out alive. Let's test your understanding. Superoxide dismutase is indispensable to... The correct answer is A. Aerobes have to have it because they cannot grow anaerobically. In this section, we covered four important physical limitations to grow. Temperature, pH, water availability, and oxygen concentration. These parameters must be in acceptable ranges for microorganisms to be able to grow. So what happens to a microbe when it runs out of nutrients, i.e. nutrient starvation? Microbes must respond. One way to prevent starvation is to store things for later. Microorganisms have a number of ways of storing material that is in abundance. They can store carbon using polymers such as glycolygen, you use this, or polyhydroxyalkanoates. Energy sources can also be stored in granules, and some examples include sulfur globules and polyphosphate granules. Here are some examples of what I just talked about. Some green bacteria will store sulfur in globules to be used later in their photosynthetic metabolism. Many organisms store phosphate, a nutrient that often becomes limiting in the environment. Shown here is polyphosphate as little granules in the cell. Many microorganisms can store a special polymer, polyhydroxyalkanoate. Often this is polyhydroxybutanoate, PHB. When times get tough, they can depolymerize this PHB and use it as a source of carbon. PHB has potential also as a source of biodegradable plastics. If nutrients do begin to run out, then a microbe will alter its metabolism as it enters stationary phase. Cells most often starve for carbon, nitrogen, or phosphorus. Cells need a way to sense impending nutrient limitation and then turn on certain pathways. Some microorganisms will change as they enter into stationary phase which I will call the hibernation approach. Others have a more dramatic differentiation to a resting cell type, which I will call the seed approach. Finally, still others will begin communal behavior to enhance survival. These are all active processes. An example of the hibernation approach is E. coli. Several different signals cause the microbe to turn on RPOS, a sigma factor. When RPOS activates, it alters expression of many genes, making E. coli more capable of survival. There are morphological changes such that cell division creates smaller and rounder cells that have a more rigid cell envelope. The nucleoid changes, condensing the DNA as the concentration of protective proteins increases. In other words, the cell is anticipating that it's going to have to hang on to this DNA 
and it wants to make sure nothing happens to it. Metabolic changes decrease the metabolic rate and protein synthesis also drops. All these changes make it more likely that the bacterium can survive until more nutrients become available. Giardia is one example of the seed approach. This protozoan is a leading cause of recreational water illness. It grows in the gastrointestinal tract causing discomfort and diarrhea. As it leaves the intestines, it will sense starvation and encase itself in a cyst. This cyst has a hard outer layer that protects it from the environment and it also turns down its metabolism until it is ingested by the next host. It then emerges from the cyst and begins growing again. One of the most studied seed approaches is endospore formation by some members of the firmicutes. These bacteria can form highly differentiated cells called endospores. The images in the bottom show the phase bright, meaning the bright things, the circular objects inside cells that are sporulating. Sporulation is an irreversible decision where the cell goes through an asymmetric division. The trigger is limiting nutrients and high cell density. There is no single signal but a collection of limitations that drive the cell into the 8 to 10 hour sporulation process. A relay of regulatory sigma factors causes waves of gene expression in the parent cell and the four spore. Cell asymmetry is essential for sporulation. This is not binary fission, but a process that creates two unique compartments. One goes on to become the parent cell and the other the four spore and eventually the spore. Sporulation is a stepwise process that begins with an asymmetric division, followed by engulfment, where the parent cell engulfs the developing spore. Then a cortex is laid down and the spore coat after that. And the exosporangium after that. Finally, the spore is released when the parent cell lyses. The final structure of the endospore makes it the ultimate resting cell. The central core is dehydrated and water is complex with calcium dipicolinic acid, giving the spore heat resistance up to 121 degrees centigrade. Complex with the DNA are DNA binding proteins that protect the DNA from electromagnetic radiation. The inner spore membrane comes from the four spore. The germ cell wall still contains a thin layer of peptidoglycan, but side, outside of that is the cortex that is modified peptidoglycan with less cross-linking. The outside spore membrane is a leftover of the parent cell. Outside this is the spore coat, a protein matrix that gives the spore its resistance to chemicals. The spore contains multiple layers of protective materials. It has near zero metabolic activity and is partially dehydrated. Spores are highly stable and resistant to dehydration, UV damage, heat, and chemicals. The table lists all the properties of endospores versus vegetative cells. Spores have been shown to survive for millions of years. Endospores extracted from ancient sea salt that was estimated to be more than 250 million years old were able to germinate and grow. That is amazing. Germination requires special conditions, not just quote, good, unquote, growth conditions. Spores germinate when cells sense favorable conditions. What is considered favorable depends upon the species. Germinant receptor proteins in inner spore membranes will sense various small metabolites. Germination of spores is usually triggered by nutrients of low molecular weight, such as amino acids, purine derivatives, and sugars. When the appropriate signal is detected, the spore will rapidly hydrate, digest its cortex and spore coat, and the vegetative cell is reconstituted. Some cyanobacteria, i.g. anabena species, have multiple responses to environmental conditions. Vegetative cells form filaments and the outer membrane is shared. The periplasm is shared also. This species can form several specialized structures. 
hormogonia are motile for dispersal and symbiosis. Aconites are for unfavorable conditions and heterocysts are for nitrogen limitation. Heterocysts are a response, as I said, are a response to nitrogen limitation. The formation of a heterocyst is eternal differentiation. The cell that begins starving for first for nitrogen will differentiate into a heterocyst. About one in 10 cells goes through this developmental program in a filament. It will form a thickened cell wall, which protects nitrogenous from oxygen. It also stops phototrophic oxygen generation and CO2 fixation, and instead fixes nitrogen, which it exports to other cells in the filament. The other cells in the filament provide energy to the heterocyst. Anabina form two other types of differentiated cells. Under light limiting conditions or phosphate limiting conditions, the bacterium forms aconites, which are a type of resting structure. The cell contains carbon and nitrogen storage molecules, a thickened cell wall, and reduced metabolic activity. These structures help them survive winters in temperate zone lakes. Hormogonia are highly modal small filaments that allow a colony to spread to other areas. They form by cell divisions without an increase in biomass and are modal by gliding motility. Mixobacteria have a social lifestyle. They travel in large populations and secrete antibiotics to kill other bacteria and digestive enzymes to degrade their victims. They respond to nutrient deprivation or desiccation by aggregating together and forming a fruiting body. About 75% of the cells make up the stalk and the other 25% turn into spores. Creating a fruiting body takes extensive cooperation and communication between cells. Mixospores are resistant to desiccation and high temperatures, though not as much as endospores. Spores will be dispersed by the wind and will germinate when nutrient conditions improve. The behavior of this organism is of intense study because it is kind of analogous to a multicellular behavior. Of the following resting structures, which do you think are most resistant to heat? If a filamentous cyanobacterium is trying to spread in the lake, which differentiation would be most useful? The answer to the first question is, of course, endospores. What property makes them so resistant to heat? It's the dehydration of the endospore cytoplasm. A filamentous cyanobacteria spreads through hormogonia, the modal small filaments that can break off from a colony and start a new one. So far in this series of lectures, we have talked about what nutrients microorganisms need and what amounts, how they grow, how we characterize it, and how they respond in nutrient limitation. If the growth of microorganisms were unlimited, it would only take a few short days to overwhelm all life on this planet. Luckily, there are limits to their growth. Nutrients run out, but also other microbes and organisms actively attack them and use them as food. Viruses are critical in controlling microbial populations. In some environments, they count for 50% of microbial cell death. There are also predatory bacteria such as Bedelovibro, Daptobacter, and Mixobacter. These organisms destroy and digest other bacteria. There are also numerous predatory proteins and small animals that eat bacteria. All of these help to keep microbial populations in check. Of course, any bacterium that is under attack by a predator is going to figure out ways to avoid that predation. A microorganism under attack may get smaller to hide from its predators. It may also get much larger so that the predator can no longer swallow it. It may secrete an exopolymer and make a biofilm that protects it, or it may make a hard to crack cell wall structure. It might be able to produce a toxin that kills the predator. Finally, it may simply swim away. These features may allow microbes to avoid predation in the human body by phagocytes and thus contribute to virulence of pathogens. Many of these methods rely on communication between the bacteria under attack and other members of its species. One example of these defenses is morphological plasticity to avoid predation. 
Filamentation is an adaptation for dealing with the threat of consumption. Ural pathogenic E. coli will make filamentous cells during infection, and these are not easily engulfed by the immune system. Thus, they can contribute to the infection and prolong the disease. Scientists have also investigated predation of bacteria such as flectobacillus species by protease because it is such a similar behavior. Filamentous bacteria larger than 7 microns in length are an edible to most protease. If a protease such as Ochromonas is consuming bacteria, the byproducts of this attack will be sensed by other flexibacillus species and cause them to form filaments. Experiments, such as the one shown at right, have demonstrated that these are small molecules that can pass through a membrane. All right, that is it for this lecture on starvation and adaptations to it.